Michel Bon, pour le sénateur, il est porté de Pétigoli, pour le sénateur, ça a été fait à Sems, pour le Pitons, 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 ça a été le docteur. Da, mi se non vuoi che sono i suoi dori, ma non mi chiamo di me, te lo adesso a sei un po' se ne va, sono mezzo anno che li via, ti insegni stati, ti ho visto che è un po' di più, ma non so, sai che non è, ma io sai che è tu arrivi, tu arrivi, che vanno dei lunghi, se ti arrivi, da, mi ho fatto di fare la guarda, mi sa, te lo amo, mi sa, non è molto più, che sa, che non è di via, ma non è molto più, 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 non Vado a fare un altro lavoro e sapere se può essere stato il disegno corretto, il fatto di una massima, 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 Sacerò di Università di Taisida, siamo che i professori di Spagna, che sono stati su Pandu, 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 che sono Tuhan kesilah suami yang berusaha studen terapi atau yang akademi dan tak semua sekuat institusi yang besar yang akan mungkin kita sangat terkejut da bila semua beberapa dosis terus dan segala yang berlaku. Atas cakap kita di sana cuma tanda sahaja yang boleh dibaca. Ia kan semua nasi dalam bahasa kita dengan cuci beberapa dosis terus semua beberapa dosis terus pas saya kata tanda kasih aku di mana tu? Saya di Swiss. E se non c'è una cosa che 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 non c'è una cosa
religijski filosofič. A da se vrlo skupno za tebi, što je to vjeda sam sveši, profesori su interni i dobri dati ti se religijski filosofič, sad su kada dojeli su prezidenti i interni, ali sam sad su kada dojeli su nadpredi, jer sam ću se cijeli. Po njega zbog cijel sličan su interni decet kluta, Rovis, Laza Kremca su univerzitetši, ima već sada s nami je mnogo imitikus i profesori statusi o eksporti su univerzitetši, više od njega cilita mi bro, pleva sva, da spada smo u univerzitetši akademiju sa kvijenom da spinu. A mi je ljudi, da ti bilje cijel i kluta, nije li su univerzitetši, orijeta samice iz kaza druge semestri, sed kluvisi su univerzitetši, orijeta samice iz šeme druge semestri, Ines od nas univerzitetči orijetacije su se skazali u drugih semestri, Liverpool su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u šemu drugih semestri, Trenki su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Edinburg su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Edinburg su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su skazali u drugih semestri, Ohio su univerzitetči orijetacije su Profesor Vičar Sumbrs, nabog bio je pomoćno da Akšmurija, a da je bi sam da bio uspodem vidata Čiluti, i bi ali sa James Joyce iz Premi iz Laurijati, Lublin iz Katoliku i Univerzitati Sabati od doktori, Lichtenstein iz Sajta Šovic od filosofi i Akademi iz Sabati od doktori, i Mitri Kanteri iz Sajtovod iz Bukarest iz Kristijala od Univerzitati Sabati od doktori, da svoj. Richard Sumer ga iz pravde cignisa da uraste neti akademiju i stati iz autovira. Mislim, naša umjetnika Artilija su opriost od sta sam ena. Oksporti su umjeriste, če Richard Sumer iz arajevni disertaci iz Hrzulane od Tavolcija. Iz Kavrčevo od Zatevčeo iz Arajevni Oksporti su umjeriste iz veliki institutosti iz profesori Lani Vini. Lani Sentinset iz Kanada, umjeriste iz profesori John Schellenbergi. Hong Kong iz Čine iz Kristijanu Prejevu Sertis direktori, profesori Kai Meng Kuan, da sva. Vičar su imeli zazvrnjeva, ištovovali gavljena vlaktina, a nam je govorio filosofi u razvrnjeva. Gavljeni je amerikali filosofosi, a ali vlaktinka, vidište da su nam sujupeni s filosofijas, da budeš ideologijas, a kad se jateljski sertis je pravo i momenti, da govori zaraz i rovnjeva. Dobro sad stan spali si Ase Dobris, sinambulist, da je zelo tudi z racionalno razlec. Še bo kmeni sadbi, zmeni sadbi. Da za se modnu skroz, kde se mi so tu teoriju kada zelo. Kale me ne pridajem filozofi sa teologi s kaj v kvalni stanah ma, si v tem izsim, ki me je za se boba, v kvalni rezac štame štavija, da reli mi iz filozofi, da interese tudi seriozo, ki prevali nas v pravo in vrec veravnis. Dakle, nisi mi komendi, a dači, saj je ta počiš polomisa. Materijalno je revolucionizmi s kritikosi, falsači v Amerike je bilo so posi Thomas Nageli in Vinč Nemstrom, isinicki, vinc Arika Hrpian, si vdrmi z tez, materijalno in da je ten misijam si cahati spis, pomenec ima suvi sa razkrevoz in materijalist, a na vedrovi kao še še jedan. Dakle, su in vrta vračevarom, če je in privala v kirogu in tudi stopjereva, a škara je skliku argumentalno in jazobas, to me nec je ove uvarni, če si kuli za ga tamo uvijate. Vse druge si su univerzitetni profesori, Eleonor Stampi, Vinčna Srov, Vinčan su nevali cikneva, skinjala leta, mišljena za danes pri rešenja, nes, veli bi izpil od filosofi iz Peroši. Ispam stelova, med stelovi argumentem sa na analizu in filosofi iz instrumentem iz gano, kaj ne bi zgaje zelje, kaj na tezmi iz teorija, a na medrovaši arsenita, kaj na vitara veliki iz filosofi iz idejevis, vidkovem sa, da ne dodeviz arsen uri arsenal. Hanti k tomu su univerzitetski profesori, Ulijan Haskersi in Mišna Srbničar su normi s etnologija, Kristijanu in odvoju še zahar, Kristijanu in tezmi še zahar, da se bili, misli Adrijo in etnologija se vrešat, v Adrijo si zrastuli, kaj je vlade muštelovani apologi in uri projekti. Vičar si imali še mogo da razpoleva zbrava in stadija disertacije za cikni Vjecuna, carno vidim kot od ravno nimes, ne sami si cikne bilo veliko sučval Vjecuna, mi še mogo da je vas. Monografija, ne in pasos iz monografija, verdi da pice bi smerdi, plantinga, sundani, da te izbi z analizu in tazva, prometelo se skavljamo se mogo, ni ljudi, a kaj se zraz od pozad skraceli. Kaj je boli, in so bili Vičar Sundberg in Sabri, godeva da Kristijano in Religija, Vičar Sundberg in Sabri, in so bili Sabri, redaktori Adgeti, kladeno in skamnice Nova, v spodi 
Senate HPC was announced when we were established as of where the Sabah Yield of course from that zone to each other soon. Next, the RSC. Next, please. Your Eminence. Your Eminence, yes. Our fathers, colleagues, and friends. I am most grateful for the very considerable honor which was to transfer upon me. The foundation of a university in Georgia devoted to Christian philosophy and psychology is very good news for the Orthodox world, and I am very glad to be associated with it. You have asked me to give a lecture describing what I have tried to achieve by my philosophical writing over the many years of my academic career. I will try to do that. Thank you for listening to me in English. The text of my uh, speech is, of course, in the book in front of you. I have always believed in God, and I had planned to become priest again at the Anglican Church. But I became conscious in my teenage years that the Western education world was beginning to regard the Church's teaching as an outdated superstition. It was coming to believe that science had shown that the laws of science, not God, determines what happens. It was coming to believe that modern secular morality provides a better guide for traditional Christian teaching. It also seemed to me that the Christian Church was complacent about this development. It just said that being a Christian was just a matter of faith and that there wasn't any significant conflict between Christian teaching and modern thought. But it said this, it seemed to me, without providing any cogent explanation of why it is rational to take this view of faith, or even explaining clearly why there was no significant conflict between Christian doctrines and modern thought. When I began to study philosophy as an undergraduate at Oxford in the 1950s, although well, I did not agree with any of the conclusions of the then influential philosophers, I began to see that these tools of rigorous arguments used in philosophy might be of use in sorting out these apparent conflicts between Christianity and modern thought. So, Coming to believe that I might help in this process of making Christianity again an intellectually respectable, I went on to do graduate work in philosophy and became not a priest but a professional philosopher. I realized that for the modern world, the physical sciences provided the paradigm of knowledge. So, I understood that in order to work in this field, I needed to know a lot about the physical sciences, both their current theories and, even more importantly, the criteria which they use for preferring one theory to another, and so why they have reached these results. Hence, after spending two years obtaining the most great way of being philosophy, which qualified me to teach philosophy at the university, after spending a year obtaining a diploma in theology, I was fortunate enough to obtain two research projects which allowed me to study science and its history. And then, in 1963, I obtained my first teaching position as a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Harvard. In order to deepen my understanding of science, I spent the first 10 years of my academic career writing on and teaching largely the philosophy of science. My first book, Space and Time, published in 1968, was much concerned with physical cosmology and in particular with the special and general theories of relativity. And I did in that book, I tried to elucidate the meaning and classification of their often somewhat paradoxical claims. After a small second book, Concept of Miracle, 1971, a small second book about the justification of claims about miracles, I wrote an introduction to the Nation Theory in 1973. This was a book crucial to the development of my natural theology. 
this book analyzed with the aid of the logical compass of probability what sort of evidence means what sort of explanatory theory of science, history, forensic inquiry, or whatever. What makes such a theory probable or more probable than some other theory? It was only after writing that book that I finally turned to work in the philosophy of religion. My first large book in this area was The Coherence of Theism, first edition in 1977, in which I analyzed the divine properties, what it means to say that God is quote, omnipotent, quote, omniscient, perfectly good, omnipresent, and so on. This book proved to be the first book of a trilogy, the other members of which were The Existence of God, 1979, and The Faith of Reason, 1981. In order not merely to list my books, but to summarize with extreme brevity two or three of their most central arguments, I will now explain how I use in the existence of God the results of my work on probability to show how the most general features of the universe may probable the existence of God. So, here's a great philosophy for you. My basic conclusion in the introduction of confirmation theory was that some piece of evidence, or pieces of evidence, makes the theory probable insofar as one if the theory is true, it's possibly probable that we can find the evidence. Two, it is much less probable, not by all right, that is in the normal course of things, that we would find that evidence. And three, the theory is simple. Criteria for a probably true scientific or any other theory. First, the theory is true, you would expect the evidence. The theory is false, you would not expect the evidence. And it makes the theory is simple. For example, suppose a same has been worked. The detective finds three pieces of evidence. The witness has failed to see John in the building at the time that the same was burned. John's fingerprints were found on the same, and an amount of money equivalent to the amount stolen is found in John's house in pieces of evidence. The detective reasonably concludes that the evidence makes it probable that John got the same. Detective grounds his conclusions are those accepted by my criteria. If John had stolen the amount of money, it's moderately probable that a witness would fail to have seen him in the building. It is moderately probable that his fingerprints would be found on the same, and it is moderately probable that money would be found in his house. But it is much less probable, second criteria, that each of these pieces of evidence would be found in the normal course of events. Each piece of evidence is some evidence that John did wrong to say, and confirms, that is, makes it more probable, the theory that John wrong to say. And the evidence is cumulative, that is, when put together, makes the overall theory probable, that is, more probable than not. However, when John is put on trial, his defending lawyer claims that these clues could easily be explained in another way by his defending lawyer's theory. This is that George got dressed up to look like John entering the building, that Henry planted John's fingerprints on the safe, and without any permission of the others, James hid the money in John's flat. This new theory would lead us to expect the total evidence just as well as does the theory that John brought the safe. And as of the detective theory, these pieces of evidence are a priori much less probable, that is, much less to be expected in the normal course of events. But the detective's theory is much more made much more probable by the evidence 
that as the lawyer's theory is not. And the reason for this is that the lawyer has not taken into account the third criterion, simplicity. The detective's theory that John Rob the same postulates one object, John, doing one thing, robbing the same, which leads us to expect the total evidence. Whereas the lawyer's theory postulates three separate objects, separate persons, doing three separate actions, unconnected with each other. Greater satisfaction of one criterion has to be weighed against worse satisfaction of another criterion. Thus, one theory may satisfy the first criterion better than another theory, but satisfy the third criterion less well. But crucially, as I illustrated, among theories that satisfy the first two criteria equally well, the simplest is the one which is probably true. <coughs> I argue that the three criteria which I have described and the one of qualified in various ways are also at work when scientists propose theories to explain phenomena. A scientific theory, such as Newton's theory of gravity, was judged to be probable because it had only four very simple laws of nature, which, together with the earlier positions and velocity of the sun and planets, made it probable that observers would observe their actual rate of positions, when otherwise there was no reason to expect this, and it was simpler than any rival theory. To amplify this, I developed a theory of simplicity applicable to the most complicated physical theories as well as to hypotheses about who committed the crime. Theory is simple, I argue, insofar as it postulates few certain substances, that is, few objects or entities, few properties, few kinds of substances, few kinds of properties properties being readily observable and related to each other by short and mathematically simple relations. One mathematical relation is simpler than another if you can understand the former without understanding the latter. Thus, addition is of such a simple relation as multiplication because we can understand what it is to add two numbers without understanding what it is to multiply two numbers by each other. And the relation involving the number 20 is as such simple as the one involving 5 to the power of 3. So, Newton's law of gravity, with all substances attracted to each other, the forces proportional to the product of their masses, is universally proportional to the square of their distance. Are postulated in mathematically simple relations between properties of distance, velocity, and mass, medium sized instances of which are readily observable and assessed by substances. Now, don't worry, you can't follow this in detail in my oral presentation, but I don't worry if you can't follow it in detail in my oral presentation. But I hope you will understand the kind of task which I claim to fulfill. And to spell out what it is this right final conclusion, or if they make why one end is better than the space of the area of what another one does. The criterion of simplicity. <coughs> Without the criteria of simplicity, there could be no science, because there will always be infinite number of rival artificial hypotheses which will satisfy the first criteria, two criteria from any body of evidence. To use a modern phrase, when we are dealing with the explanation of events in human history, the criterion of simplicity rules out conspiracy theories. Given this understanding of the nature of arguments for the probable truth of experimental theories, I then proceeded to argue that the most probable explanation of the most general features of the universe is provided by the theory of theism, that there is a God, the 
and was it by Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and has analyzed in my book, The Dead Buildings, Evil. I began to say this, thanks to the general teacher of the university, the name of the college of the service of God, by arguing that the theory that there exists an essentially everlasting omnipotent being is a fairly simple theory because it affirms the existence of just one substance, one being, with just one property, power, with zero minutes to the degree of a readily observable property, zero, simple number, existing for a length of time to which there are zero limits. It postulates just one substance with one power, a degree to which there are zero limits, lasting for a time to which there are zero limits, and simplicity in the object, in the power described, and the property described, and the degree and time for which that property exists. A very simple theory. I then went on to argue that the existence of an essentially omnipotent being entails other divine properties of God. And I argued for that in the years of years. An omnipotent being is one who can do anything logically possible, that is anything that does not involve a contradiction. Such a being could eliminate the physical universe at an instant. You could change the laws of nature at an instant, and so on and so on. But you could not make me both think both exist and not exist at the same time, for well, that is self-contradictory. I argue that it then followed from his omnipotence that he would also be omniscient in the sense that he would know everything that is happening and everything that is going to happen, insofar as this is not already chosen what will happen. Far as he has already chosen what will happen to him. But such a being may not yet already have chosen what is going to happen, and he may give to rational beings the freedom to make choices themselves within those strict limits as to what is going to happen. If God is to know what other choices are available to him, he must know which of his possible actions are good and which are bad. To know that some action is good is always to have an inclination to do it. We humans are subject to confusing desires to do bad things. And so we have chosen to we have to choose between good and bad. But a truly omnipotent God would not be subject to influences unchosen by him. And so he would always choose the good. Hence, an omnipotent being would be perfectly good. So, I have just been spelling out my claim that the postulation of a one being omnipotent to whose length of existence and whose power there are zero limits entails that being will be omniscient in the state of sense and perfectly good. So, an essentially everlasting omnipotent being would necessarily be omniscient and perfectly good. And it followed from these, I argued, that he would have all the properties traditionally associated with God, such as being omnipresent, the creator of any universe that is, and the source of knowledge. So, an essentially everlasting being would be God as worshipped by Christians and Jews and Muslims. Hence, the hypothesis of theism is entailed by the very simple hypothesis that there exists an essentially everlasting being. So I argue for the criterion of simplicity in this. Uh, I might refer to my criteria for I argue that the hypothesis also satisfies the other two criteria very well in 
давайте не Every object 
to be with us through our space and time as the power to attract every other object with a force proportional to us, the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. And the liability always to exercise that power. There is therefore this vast coincidence in the powers and liabilities of objects at all times and in all places. This enormous coincidence is not to be expected in the normal course of things. The normal course of things you expect one substance to pay one way and one substance to another way. And always the objects in the universe behave in exactly the same way. If all the coins of some region have the same mark region have the same markings, or all the papers in the room in the room are written in the same handwriting, we seek an explanation of this in terms of a common source of these experiments and physics. We should seek a similar explanation for that vast coincidence which we describe as the conformity of the laws of nature. Even if there are simple laws of nature, there is no reason to expect that these laws would be the kind of which, given the initial state of the universe, would lead to the evolution of human beings. There are innumerable possible kinds of simple laws and innumerable different forms of the laws of the first four forces, gravity, electromagnetism, strong force, and the force known to us, which would not lead to the evolution of bodies like now. And finally, even if there are such laws, there is not the slightest reason to suppose that they will be right to consciousness. So my second criterion for a probably true explanation is abundantly well satisfied by the theory of theism. So, just in case of any little loss, um, the point is, I believe it's a simple theory. Uh, the simple theory is probably true insofar as if it's true, you would expect the phenomena. I have heard that you would expect God to produce human beings and these features are necessary for the existence of human beings. I have argued that it is extremely unlikely that these features would occur unless they have such a common cause. You would expect everything to behave in exactly the same way, exactly the same way that it would us. And the theory is simple. So, the module that the most general features of the universe make it very positive that there is a God, and that can be said by the same criteria as the universe on other areas of activity. On this view, God is the creator and sustainer of everything at every time. And all that happens is due to God, except when humans are allowed by God to exercise their own free will. God causes all these things almost entirely by keeping the laws of nature operating, which is to be understood as conserving in all physical objects their powers to produce effects in other physical objects and their liability to exercise their powers. Although it's also compatible with God very occasionally setting aside the laws of nature, that is, by altering the powers and liabilities of the objects to produce a miracle. In his discovery of the vast extent and age of the universe, and the almost uniform operation of laws of nature simple enough for humans to understand, science is the friend and not the enemy of religion. For science has shown how great is the power of God in creating and sustaining all this. And how a good God, how good God is in making the universe which humans can begin to understand and in which they can flourish. It is a consequence of the great good that humans have the powers to choose between good and evil. But it is quite probable for us that they will often choose evil, and that is the basis of the point of reason for supposing that there will be much evil as well as good in the world. And I've argued in detail in the 
existence of God and in a later book, Providence and the Problem of Evil, not only might we expect such evil, it might expect evil of a great and a kind quantity as we find. What I have been describing is my natural theology, as it is called. And the orthodox thought of the past 500 years has not always thought very well of natural theology. But I think that in this respect, it is out of line with the earlier Eastern Christian tradition. There was a lot of natural theology in the word writings of Eastern Christian theology as a personal invention. Arguments of many different kinds from many different phenomena to the existence of God. And this is well as illustrated in an essay by Adam C. Parkinson in a recent collection edited by David Bradshaw and myself, Natural Theology, in the Eastern Orthodox Tradition. But what, you may reasonably ask, is the relevance of such sophisticated arguments? to the practice of the Christian religion. And this topic was the topic of the third book of my trilogy about theism, faith, and reason. I argue there that it is always rational to believe that there is a God on the basis of deep religious experience, or on the basis of having been taught this by someone who can trust, but only in the absence of counter arguments. It's always the rational to believe God to see the religious experience, but it is always rational to believe any experience. And it's always rational to believe what you are told by trustworthy people. But all this only in the absence of counter observers. In the modern world, most of us are well aware of counter arguments purporting to show that there is no God. So there is a great need for many of us, but not for all of us, for patient arguments to show that it is at least moderate probability that there is a God. Then we can choose whether we wish to live the life that most probably is the best life, that is the life of which God, if he exists, will approve, or not to live such a life, not caring whether or not there is a God without having some sort of rational justification for believing in the of God, it would be foolish to try to live the life of God if he were to exist and would approve. But of course, there is more to Christianity than belief in the God worshipped by Jews and Muslims as well as by Christians. And I devoted my next three books to analyzing the meaning and justification of particular Christian doctrine. Responsibility and Atonement, 1989, was concerned with how the death of Christ provides atonement for our sins. Revelation, 1992, considered what would constitute evidence that God would reveal to through some topic of society, and it applied the results of this inquiry to establishing our grounds for believing the teaching of Christ and the church which found it. And then in the Christian God, 1994, I considered what it means to claim that God is the three persons of one essence and that he became incarnate in Jesus Christ. And I considered the justification of the holding of these doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation. Since justification for the results of these three books depends in part on my claims that by raising Jesus from the dead, God put his signature on Jesus. I devoted a book, The Resurrection of God in Carmen, to assessing the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and showed that the balance of evidence makes that solvable. I should add that it was just during this period of my life that I was received in 1995 into the Orthodox Church by Metropolitan Callistos, another honorary doctorate of this university. Unsurprisingly, over the many years since I have first wrote these books, many philosophers have made objections to my views. I myself have needed to develop my own arguments and sometimes many of them in my own respects. Hence a considerable new book, Epistemic Justification. 
limitations which are as one, but well, the nature of rational political knowledge developed from my earlier ideas on probability. I have also produced second editions of the Theodorus of Theism, the existence of God, faith in reason and revelation, which involved not merely amending and adding unto the passages, but large revisions of my other book, and the Georgian translation of the second edition of Faith in Reason by Tamara Bernstein-Zensky was just being published by the Indian University Press. Also, conscious of the need to make my sometimes philosophically difficult book successful for wide public, I have produced two short books which cover most of the areas which I have described, although in the end of the day, that is in faith, is the God of 1996, and was Jesus God in 2008. In the last two years, I have devoted most of my attention to the nature of human beings, and in particular to the two doctrines essential to Christianity about that nature, humans have to the world, and the humans on the earth consist of two parts, the physical body and the non-physical soul, of which the soul is the one essential part. The first of these two doctrines is necessary if humans are to be morally responsible for their actions, and so on which will also draw out of their sins. The second doctrine, a particular version of which is called substance dualism, is necessary for it to be possible for humans to fight death when their bodies lie in the grave or are annihilated in the crematorium. For given that doctrine, the doctrine of substance dualism, whatever happens to the original body, the soul could be united again with the body in general resurrection, either one made of the original matter or one made of a quite new matter. And although I have treated with these issues in one of their book, the evolution of the soul, I felt the need for a different treatment of them, and hence books, Mind, Rest, Free Will, 2014, and the much shorter, Other Bodies or Souls, 2019. I believe that I have produced very strong arguments, especially in the latter book, showing the need to us as a soul, which makes us who we are. My human arguments for human free will are much more genuine, and it's possible I may have something more to say about this topic in the future. My version of substance dualism, as presented in Army Bodies for Souls, has two parts. In the first part, I argue that having a non physical soul is necessary for our existence. That is, we could not exist without it. And in the second part, I argue that having such a soul is sufficient for our existence. That is, we could exist without a soul. All I can do in this lecture is to give you a very brief account of the first part of this argument. I begin with theories of personal identity. The theory of personal identity is a theory of what makes one person at one time the same person as a person earlier time. For example, what makes me lecturing to you now the same person as a person of the same name who was an undergraduate at Oxford in the 1950s? As the series seems to answer, it's not what causes me to be the same, or how could we know that I am the same, but what it is for me to be the same person. That is, what other conditions are logically necessary and sufficient for the latent person to be the same person as the earlier person. One obvious answer is that I am the same person, but I mean if I have the same body as the earlier person, but how much of the same body? We write this at those, if anyone loses some bodily part, for example, by a liver, mutation, or a heart burns one, that makes no difference to who they are. But the one exception to this is surely the brain, because it is on the brain that our conscious mind depends. When we make a bodily movement intentionally, we do that by cause of a brain event which causes the bodily movement. And when we learn anything about perception, we 
you then because the observable world also is a brain and then you dance. So perhaps a later person is the same person as an earlier person, if an alien they have the same brain. But again, the same question arises, how much of the same brain? Sometimes a person has a part of their brain removed, and we tend to think that that makes no difference to who they are. Surgeons are now beginning to be able to rejoin severed nerves in the spine, and spinal nerves are nerves of the same kind as nerves in the brain, the neurons. So it should be possible within the next few decades, not merely to be able to remove a part of the brain, but to replace it with a part of another brain. But each part of the brain which is removed is replaced by a similar part of another brain. How much of their original brain needs to be retained for a person to continue to exist? Perhaps a criterion for whether such changes still preserve the identity of the person might be whether the later person can remember the experiences of the earlier person. But that again, but again, how many of the memories need to be accurate? In answer to these questions, many different theories of personal identity or context theories have been developed over the past 70 years. Such theories specify that a person is the same person as an earlier person, if and only if the later person has a certain proportion of the earlier person's brain and or a certain number of memories of what happened to the earlier person. But all such theories seem to find the arbitrary. Why suppose that a person is the same if they have 60% of the earlier person's brain rather than 59%? Or if they can remember 50 instances of the past person's life rather than 29? Whatever the detailed theory of such a kind, it would not be unreasonable for a person about to undergo an operation in which the subsequent person would only just satisfy the conditions laid down by the particular theory of survival, still to see the fear that the theory might be mistaken that they would not survive the operation and that the post operation person would be someone else. It is implausible to suppose that any such theory is logically necessary. Any theory that says if 60% of your brain is removed, then the later person is the same as you, but if 59, only 59% is removed, then the later person is the same as you. That theory is the sort of theory that looks terribly arbitrary and unplausible. So it cannot, it is impossible to suppose that any such theory is necessary, logically necessary, when you're trying to work out what is necessary for what those So it cannot be logically sufficient for me to be the same person to have a certain proportion of my present brain and a certain number of memories, or more generally, any quantity of a divisible substance or any degree of a property of which there can be degrees, because it would be arbitrary to specify the particular quantity or degree. What is necessary for being me must include something indivisible. Every physical thing larger than a fundamental part is what is divisible, and it is implausible to say to remove any one particular fundamental part of so being me must require the existence of something indivisible, which is non-visible, that is, a soul. Having much the same brain and many men and women members, the good evidence that a person may survive the complicated brain operation, but it cannot be logically sufficient for that. Something else must be necessary. And that, filled out in detail, and buttressed against objections, is my reason for holding that the continued existence of our soul is 
technologically necessary conditions for the continued existence of each of us, we need a truly visible part, a non-physical part, or so which constitutes the main. In all that I am trying to do, I have begun from some claim which would be accepted by the modern world. And proceeding from there, I have tried to use the criteria of probable truth, which are also accepted by the modern world, and to follow the argument where I believe it leads. So that is to the doctrine of the Christian creed. In pursuing this path, I have followed the recommendation of Gregory of Nyssa. I quote, quotation from the Great Catechism. It is necessary to regard the opinions of the persons with whom you are debating as taken up, and to frame your arguments in accordance with the error into which each has fallen by advancing in each discussion certain principles and reasonable propositions that, through what is agreed on both sides, the truth may conclusively be brought to light. Should someone say that there is no God, then, from the consideration of the skillful and wise economy of the universe, we will be drawn to acknowledge that there is a certain overmastering power manifested through these channels. If, on the other hand, we should have no doubt as to the existence of a deity, we should be inclined to entertain the presumption of the plurality of gods, then we will adopt other arguments, and if the non Christian is Jewish, then again, other different arguments are needed. I have been only one of many analytic philosophers of religion of recent years working on the meaning and justification of religious claims. We have all used or adapted results or methods used in other branches of philosophy, such as philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, and so on. And it is for that reason that other analytic philosophers have come to recognize that philosophy of religion is a proper part of a philosophy of celibus. When I started on my intellectual journey in the late 1950s, religious issues got very little attention in the philosophy syllabi of the rest of the world. And the attention they did get was very superficial. But over the past 60 years, arguments for and against the existence and nature of God have been taken a lot more seriously by analytic philosophers. And most universities and colleges in the anglo world provide as possible options in philosophy courses on the philosophy of religion in which these issues are discussed in a rigorous way. Whether this has resulted in any more philosophers becoming religious, I have no idea. But religion is taken more seriously in philosophy departments as a useful for that choice. While some of this work is rather sophisticated and difficult for non philosophers easily to understand, there have been many popular presentations of these ideas, and so that some of them have reached the wide educated world. Then there is, of course, so much more work to be done, and it will be done almost entirely by others, among whom, I hope, the Georgian philosophers will play their part. So, I've given you a philosophical lecture, and I'm afraid that some of the arguments are a bit tight and rigorous, but I hope you've got some idea of what I am trying to do in my academic life, and indeed the sort of work that many others have tried to do, and I hope you all will be Sunshine, 
Robles, what's a kid with Shemu, Adamian's Perry, Associates, and Long Steba, the other person's Patron Swing or Nim, South of Serigis, Philosophies, Polypolushi, Serving the Sul Polypolushi, down to the Visha Saber, Chen Wassen, the one telling me who might now be the game, Serving Saturday, is not under me, Polypon, the Visha, the Tetia, Setia, is the other Christian, the Philosophy, and the other side. Ես ամասենակ հիվ են նավիջ են չեն ունիվերստետիսա, դա առամարդով, այամ իստորիան ուսա չեն ու ծադետրով, նավիջ նավիջ կատոլ կոնձեպտուալորի խերմիտ, դա ավետոս կատոլ թանի վերոց ես հարի խոմարդիրիցակությությությությությությությությությությությությությությու Իշտով ուղարի դարգի է, սակարտով չես մաս է եկ ուղթի, սիվիտովրով մարդուլի ինտելեկտորովի տրադիսի ասետով Քիստիանում եմ կտրովի թարիս կաջերեմուլի, դա չես մաս առպսարվակ է թե պատոյդի չարվից մաս առպս Մեն իսիս մոդերի, ռոմեր սած պատոնի ռիճարդի տավազով, սես սարեն թանավետրովի, անուս ամբով սանցինք շիտցով, ռածիոնալիսմի արիսի, իստաց ամրետոս թանդ ծպենասունդահաղթտեսթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթթ
Gracias.